Birthday Blues Disappointed in Boyfriend's Gift It started with the wrapping paper. Neon yellow, with some weird red squiggles that looked like they were designed by a toddler armed with a permanent marker. I stared at it, a sinking feeling forming in my stomach. The kind of feeling you get when you realize you've accidentally eaten someone else's sandwich at work disbelief, a flicker of hope you might be mistaken, and then the gnawing sense that, no, this is happening to you. And this was supposed to be my gift, from Nathan, my boyfriend of three years. Do you want to open it? He said, grinning and nudging it toward me. He was perched on the edge of the couch, that confident smile on his face, and the sight of it made me falter for a second. This was the smile that made me fall in love with him bold, unbothered, and vaguely self-assured. I wanted to believe that maybe just maybe what was inside would make up for the haphazard wrapping job and the fact that it was, quite obviously, a box of the wrong shape for anything I'd mentioned wanting. Sure, let's see what you've cooked up, I said, trying to keep my voice light. But I already knew it wouldn't be good. I started to pull off the paper, unfolding each side carefully, as if taking it slow might somehow yield a different result. As soon as I saw the plain white cardboard box beneath, a little sigh of disappointment slipped out before I could stop it. Nathan didn't seem to notice. Oh, come on, he nudged me playfully, I think you'll like it. With a resigned sigh, I lifted the lid, peering inside at what looked suspiciously like a set of wireless headphones. Noise cancelling, he added, his face lit with genuine excitement. You know, for when you're reading. I tried. I really tried to match his energy, to find something positive about the gift he'd just given me. But it wasn't the gift I wanted or even remotely needed. I dropped hints about wanting a weekend getaway or, heck, even a spa day. I talked about how burned out I was, how much I craved an escape from the city. He knew this. I smiled, but it was thin, and I could feel the cracks spreading through it as I forced to thank you. You don't like it? Nathan's smile faltered for a moment. No, it's, nice. Thank you. The words felt hollow in my mouth, but I couldn't seem to summon anything else. I hated feeling ungrateful, hated that I couldn't just appreciate the gesture without this prickling sense of being misunderstood. But there was something there this gnawing feeling that he just didn't get me. That night, I lay awake, staring at the ceiling, replaying the disappointment on his face. He would looked so genuinely confused when he asked me why I wasn't thrilled. I tried to shake off the memory, but it hung around, nagging at me, gnawing at my brain like some unwelcome thought I couldn't unthink. It wasn't just the headphones I knew that. The headphones were just the latest chapter in the book of Nathan doesn't get me. I could think of a hundred little examples the way he'd choose movies he knew I found boring, or how he'd brush off my feelings as if they were inconsequential, like something you'd shake out of a shoe. Our relationship had slowly morphed from exciting and fun to something that felt like a half-hearted routine. And yet, breaking up had never seriously crossed my mind until tonight. The next day at work, I found myself venting to my friend Lena over lunch. Lena, who had been happily married for five years, listened with that sympathetic look only best friends can give, letting me spill my frustrations while occasionally nodding, her eyes big and patient. I vented about the birthday gift, his complete lack of awareness, the sinking feeling that I was living in a relationship with someone who didn't actually see me. Lena listened until I ran out of words, and then she took a sip of her coffee and said something that stuck. Do you ever talk to him about this? I mean, actually talk? I blinked. We talk all the time, Lena. She raised an eyebrow. I mean, actually tell him how you feel. Not just hinting or dropping little clues, but telling him straight out. Her words sank in, feeling both deeply uncomfortable and completely correct. The truth was, no I hadn't really opened up to him. I kept my real feelings close to the chest, afraid of being too difficult or too demanding. I told myself it was easier this way, that it was my job to be the easygoing one, the understanding one. I'd become so good at swallowing my feelings, they'd practically disappeared from sight. That evening, as Nathan and I sat on the couch, him scrolling through his phone and me fiddling with a loose thread on my sweater, I decided to try something new. Nathan? I said, my voice quiet but steady. Hmm. He looked up, his face softening as he saw me. Despite everything, it was moments like this that reminded me why I'd fallen for him. Underneath the layers of misunderstanding, there was a warmth, a comfort, a home. I just wasn't sure if it was still enough. I want to talk about yesterday, I started, fumbling over the words like I was testing out a new language. It's not about the gift. I just feel like. I feel like we've been missing each other lately. He looked at me, eyebrows knit, as if trying to piece together a puzzle. What do you mean? I took a breath, letting the words come as they would. I don't think you really know what I need right now. And I know I haven't made it easy for you to understand me, but just feels like you don't see me. Silence hung between us, thick and uncomfortable. 
For a second, I thought he might laugh it off, make a joke to ease the tension, but then I saw something shift in his expression a flicker of realization. I thought. I thought you'd like the headphones, he said finally, his voice barely above a whisper. I thought that would make you happy. I smiled, a real smile this time, bittersweet as it was. It's not that the headphones are bad, Nathan. It's just that sometimes. I wish you'd ask me what would make me happy. For the first time, I saw a flash of uncertainty in his eyes. Nathan was rarely unsure of himself, but there it was a crack in his armor. I guess I just. I just thought I already knew. In the weeks that followed, things didn't change overnight. We stumbled, awkwardly, trying to relearn how to understand each other. It was strange, really, how much work went into simply listening, how hard it was to be vulnerable after months, years even, of trying to be fine with things. One night, after a long week, Nathan surprised me with a trip to a tiny beachside cabin. It wasn't the luxurious escape I'd imagined for my birthday, but there was something sweet and thoughtful about the effort he'd made this time. He'd packed my favorite books, filled a tiny cooler with my favorite snacks, and planned a day for us to do nothing but listen to the ocean. As we sat there on the shore, watching the sun set into the horizon, Nathan turned to me, brushing sand off his hands. You know, I think I spent a lot of time trying to be what I thought you wanted, he said, his tone raw, open, but I forgot to actually figure out who you were. I'm sorry for that. I leaned against his shoulder, closing my eyes. I'm sorry, too. I think I tried too hard to keep things easy, when maybe I needed to be harder on us. He laughed, a low, warm laugh that rumbled against my cheek. Headphones, more beach weekends? I grinned, reaching for his hand. Or time spent figuring each other out. Life with Nathan didn't suddenly become a fairy tale after that. There were still moments of tension, days where we slipped into old patterns. But as the months went by, I could feel us growing, both together and apart. The little things the questions, the moments of honesty started weaving us into something stronger. It wasn't perfect, but it was real. And as we stood there, hand in hand, letting the tide wash away the sand beneath our feet, I realized that, for the first time in a long time, I felt seen. And for now, that was enough.